The term sound barrier first came into use during World War II. Fighter pilots who made high-speed dives noticed irregularities as flying speeds approached the speed of sound. Aerodynamic drag increased markedly, much more than normally associated with increased speed, while lift and maneuverability decreased in a similarly unusual way. Pilots at the time mistakenly thought that these effects meant that supersonic flight was impossible, that somehow planes would never travel faster than the speed of sound. Tuesday, October the 14th, 1947, was the date earmarked for Jaeger's next X-1 flight. Although there was no set goal of trying to go supersonic on that day, a sense of anticipation was growing among everyone involved with the project, given how close the plane had been flirting with the barrier. But on the Saturday before the flight, Jaeger and his wife Glenis were out horseback riding, when Jaeger hit a fence that had been closed across a road, was thrown off, and ended up cracking two ribs. Rather than let the flight surgeon know about his injury and risk being grounded, Jaeger and his buddy Jack Ridley decided to try a workaround. Flying the plane wasn't going to be a problem. The snag was that with his injured right side, Jaeger wouldn't be able to close the cockpit door with his right arm. The solution? Ridley sawed off a 10-inch length of a broomstick so that Jaeger, once in the pilot's seat, would have enough leverage to push the locking mechanism closed. With the B-29 at 8,000 feet, Jaeger climbed down into the 250 mile per hour ice cold slipstream, bending double and climbing painfully into the dark little cockpit. A few minutes later came the drop into the blinding light of day and then a wild ride into the history books. Jaeger fired off all four engine chambers, climbed to 35,000 feet, turned off two of the chambers and continued to climb to 42,000 feet before leveling off and reigniting the third chamber. With the Mach meter showing Mach 0.92, he experienced the usual buffeting. At Mach 0.97, the needle suddenly jumped off the scale. The maximum value marked on it was 1.0. At first, Jaeger thought the instrument was faulty and radioed, it's gone kinda screwy on me. On the ground, a loud bang was heard, not the X1 breaking up, but breaking through the sound barrier. Suddenly the buffeting stopped and Jaeger took the rocket plane up to Mark 1.07, about 650 miles per hour, before gliding back to base and the congratulations of a select handful of people who knew about the achievement. The X-1 project was classified, and news that the sound barrier had been crossed wasn't made public until June of the following year. With supersonic flight now a reality and fears about the sound barrier blown away, there was a major push to move on to much higher speeds. The research was important to the field of aerospace as a whole and the development of new high-performance fighter planes in particular. Even as work began on new X-planes such as the Bell X-2 rocket plane with its swept, angled back wings and the incredibly slender jet-powered Douglas X-3 stiletto, the original X-1, which eventually reached 1,000 miles per hour, evolved into a number of variants. One of these, the X-1A, was piloted by Jaeger on December 12, 1953 to another speed record, Mark 2.4. But on this occasion, events threatened to get seriously out of hand, and only Jaeger's experience managed to save the day. The X-1A was about 7 feet longer than the old X-1 and carried almost twice as much fuel so that it could accelerate for much longer. After three flights, Jaeger had already cranked the new plane up to Mark 1.9. The fourth flight started well with a good drop and all four rocket chambers firing, powering the plane on a steep climb through 60,000 feet, 70,000 feet and on up to 80,000 feet. By now the X-1A was passing Mark 2.3, gaining another 30 miles per hour every second. Suddenly the plane started to yaw, its nose drifting to one side. Jaeger responded by pushing the rudder to try to get the nose back in line but it had no effect. The yaw got worse, and then the outside wing began to rise. The situation quickly became desperate. The aircraft rolled until it was flying upside down, pitched up. The stress on the cockpit canopy was too great and it split open, exposing Jaeger to the cold, thin outside air and causing his pressure suit to inflate. The X-1A was rolling ferociously as if it were the most vicious corkscrew roller coaster you could imagine, rotating twice around a second and putting Jaeger through a withering 9G. 
Ground and sky flash by in dizzying succession, but crucially, Jaeger stayed conscious and alert to what was happening with the plane. As the X-1A ran out of fuel, it slowed and the rolling stopped. Jaeger saw the sky below him and the horizon going round and round and realized he was in an inverted flat spin, pulling negative Gs. Not ideal, but at least he knew what to do about it. Test pilots are as used to spinning planes as test drivers are to making handbrake turns and they know exactly how to make them stop. Set the aileron, the hinge flap on the trailing edge of each wing, with the spin direction, apply the rudder, then fall out of the spin. It worked. The whole ordeal from the time the aircraft started to yaw at 80,000 feet until Jaeger popped out of the spin at 25,000 feet lasted a mere 51 seconds but contained enough stomach-churning action and danger to last most ordinary mortals a lifetime. Throughout it all, Jaeger had to contend with a smashed canopy, exposure to the sub-arctic cold of high altitude and a bulked-out, inflated pressure suit. But now he was as good as home. Looking around, he spotted his landing site, Rogers Dry Lake, about 50 miles away, and glided on back to base. The X-1A had made its first and only excursion above Mark II.